I'm going to introduce our presenter, John Ralston. John was born and raised in Southern California. He attended University of the Pacific in Stockton, California, obtaining a bachelor's degree in sports medicine. John then moved to Tucson in 2000 and has lived in the old Pueblo to this day. He worked for several years in education at the Arizona State School for the Deaf and Blind, then worked for 16 years as a licensed massage therapist before returning to school to become an actor puncturist. John has served on and been president of several homeowners associations. John is a member of the Arizona Green Party, as well as the Pima County Green Party. Why RCV? John wants a multi-party democracy that can bring diverse people with diverse ideas to the table to discuss the problems that face our communities, state, country, and world. Our current plurality voting system effectively prevents this from happening because it is structurally coercive and limits voters' choices as well as incentivizing a race to the bottom in terms of behavior and discourse. Ranked choice voting is one step in the process of citizens reasserting their control over their democracy and their lives. John, it's up to you. All right, well, thank you. Your mic. Can everybody hear me on the mic? Good, okay. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ashley, everybody here at Ollie. Um, we're very excited to be uh, talking to you today. Um, my uh, associate here, Emmy, is also with Voter Choice Arizona. I'm, as I, as uh, Ron said, my name is John Ralston. I'm a volunteer with this organization called Voter Choice Arizona. We are an organization that's working on a voting reform called Ranked Choice Voting, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so just a few, just kind of an overview. Um, again, we're going to hold questions uh, until the end of the, the presentation. The presentation is about an hour, about an hour long. I've tried to make this as comprehensive as possible and tried to, to frame it from the perspective of, of a layman's perspective. I'm not an expert. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not uh, an election scientist. Um, but uh, I've wanted to rank choice voting for 23 years, and I've thrown myself into this once I found Voter Choice Arizona. I've tried to educate myself as best as possible, and I've tried to synthesize the theory and, and uh, scholarly speak into plain English and present that to you uh, in hopefully a fair way. Um, with that said, we uh, I and our organization do have a perspective. We do have a bias. We do like ranked choice voting. We're working actively to implement ranked choice voting. If you disagree, that's fine. Um, but the intent here is to educate, and I'm going to try and do this as fairly as possible. If you disagree with the framing or how I present things, that's fine. It's not. I'm not trying to be manipulative or anything like that. I'm just trying to educate as best as possible. Uh, so. Um, with that said, uh, who are we? Uh, we're an organization called Voter Choice Arizona. Let's see, what's that? All right, so Voter Choice Arizona is a 501c uh, nonprofit. That's kind of a corporate uh, tax kind of designation, it means that we're like an educational organization. We were formed in uh, March of 2020, right before the shutdown, uh, which was inopportune in terms of our, our progress, uh, but uh, we've, since kind of made up for lost time because even after the uh, lockdowns. Our mission is to improve our elections so that voters have more choice and more voice for better governance in a better Arizona. Our goal is to uh, enact electoral reforms in the state of Arizona, specifically ranked choice voting. There are gonna be a couple other reforms that I'll touch upon during the presentation. And our focus for 2023 is to educate Arizonans on the benefit of ranked choice voting, build our and support our growth, grow our endorsements list and funds. There, there's not gonna be a pitch for money during this presentation, this is educational. And then we're gonna try and get on the ballot in 2024 to try and implement ranked choice voting here in Arizona. So whenever I do these kind of presentations, I've been doing them for about three years now, uh, I always get kind of a, at least one or two people, oops, come on. 
I always get kind of the side eye from some people like, who are you? Where, what's, what's going on? Who's behind you? Who's paying for this? Uh, so this slide is just kind of to represent uh, our organization as well as our partners. Um, so we're Voter Choice Arizona. We are a fully autonomous grassroots organization. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit. We have two employees. I think we may have one more coming on board, uh, but we're kind of a small scrappy organization. Uh, we partner with these other organizations, uh, represent us as kind of a good government anti-corruption group. Fair Vote is an educational organization that champions voting reforms, specifically ranked choice voting. They also have an uh, advocacy arm called Fair Vote Action. Save Democracy is, a, is an Arizona organization that we partner with. Um, we're in favor of ranked choice voting. They're in favor of another kind of, kind of voting reform called open, open or nonpartisan primaries. Uh, so we've kind of joined forces, formed like a political peanut butter cup. Uh, you know, you got your chocolate in my peanut butter. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. So we, we're putting our ranked choice voting in their uh, open primaries. They're putting their own open primaries in our ranked choice voting, and we're working together. Uh, we're a grassroots organization. This is a little bit more of a kind of a business leadership type group, business leaders. Okay. Oh, Save Democracy. Save Democracy is kind of a little bit more of a Chamber of Commerce business leadership type group. Rank the Vote is uh, an organization that grew out of uh, a campaign in Massachusetts to bring ranked choice voting to Massachusetts. That campaign was unsuccessful. However, the leaders in that organization formed this group, Rank the, Rank the Vote, which goes around and identifies ranked choice voting supporters and activists in different states and kind of Johnny Appleseeds. Uh, groups like Voter Choice Arizona, and they provide uh, support and training and things like that for volunteers like myself. Unite Arizona is part of a bigger group called Unite America. They're a, kind of a centrist organization that, and they uh, support ranked choice voting. And then the Institute for the Political for Political Innovation is another uh, organization that uh, supports ranked choice voting. They support kind of a hybrid, something called final five voting, which I'll get into uh, during the uh, presentation. The, the, the founder of this organization is a business leader. Her name's Catherine Gell. She wrote a book called The Politics Inst Industry, in case you're familiar with that. But anyways, this is, uh, these are our, our, our supporters. This is our group. Uh, so if you have questions or you want to do research, have at it. We're, we have nothing to hide. We're fully transparent. So kind of as we get started, I want to everybody to kind of keep a couple things in mind. Uh, the first is the, the First Amendment. There are five freedoms associated with the First Amendment, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech, assembly, and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. Uh, three of those five freedoms, speech, assembly, and, and redress are encapsulated in elections and candidates and, and parties and campaigns. And so just kind of keep that in mind as we kind of move along in the presentation. Another thing I want everybody to keep in mind is that there's consistent polling over probably the last five, or se five to seven years that Americans want, quote unquote, a third party. That's not exactly true in our culture. We kind of speak in code. Uh, these people aren't running out to join the Green Party or the Libertarian Party. A few people are joining the, the Forward Party and things like that. But what they really mean is that, is that they want more choices. So keep that in mind. Americans want more choices. So a little bit about me. This is me politically. Uh, just because you fit in doesn't mean that you belong there. Um, I'm, the, I'm the tangerine in the, in the garlic bulb. Uh, my father was kind of a John McCain style Republican. He's the greatest man I've ever known. Unfortunately, he passed in 2005. Uh, my mother is kind of a Marianne Williamson style Democrat, uh, which is which is kind of ironic because my mother thinks Marianne Williamson is a dingbat, um, and I'm like a mom pot kettle. Um, but anyways, uh, I have this kind of mixed ideological nature and nurture aspect to to my uh, to my political personality, um, and as a result, I I get along with people, I see people's perspectives, but I don't always fit into the tribe. And I often offend the tribe, depending on whatever the particular uh, issue of de jure is. And as it pertains to politics, I've, I'm very civically engaged. And I think it's important as a citizen to be engaged and uh, in, engage with uh, our, our civic life. We don't have a king. You know, we all give our consent to be governed. And, you know, we need to kind of 
bond together and, and hash things out so that we can make things better and solve problems. Um, but I find that our politics and particularly our elections leave me uh, leave a lot to be lacking, a lot to to improve upon. I, I often don't like the, the choices that I have when I, when I get my ballot and I do the best that I can. Uh, but uh, if only there were a solution to that, which I will get to. So as we get started for this conversation, just gonna highlight a couple of things, a couple of rhetorical questions. Uh, when you vote in Arizona elections, do you have the choices or represent your views? Uh, do you want more candidate choices in, in Arizona elections? Is negative partisanship too commonplace in Arizona elections? Now, before I started with this organization, I had no idea what negative partisanship means. It's essentially kind of oppositional defiance disorder as it comes to politics. Um, like, for example, so if Scott and I are from different political parties or different tribes, if he's something for something, I'm automatically against it. That's negative partisanship. It's the breakdown of communication and, and reasoning just because of tribal identity. That's my definition of, of negative, negative partisanship. So is that too commonplace in our, in, our, in our elections? Is our election campaign seasons too long? Uh, do you feel that candidates campaign on issues that matter to you? And are we electing candidates who can are prepared to lead us into the future? And we're not going to you know, have a show of hands or anything like that. But if you answer to no to any one of those questions, we're going to suggest that in part, the problem is with the structure of the way that we vote. So what's wrong with our current voting system? So for the sake of clarity, you know, our current voting system is referred to as plurality voting. It's referred to as first past the post. That's kind of a horse racing reference. It's referred to as pick one voting because you get your ballot, you pick one, sit at your ballot, God bless America. For our conversation, I'm just going to refer to it as our current voting system. Oops. Um, and there, to the extent that our current voting system works is when there are two candidates, you get your ballot, there's two candidates on the ballot, you pick one, somebody wins, somebody loses, God bless America. However, uh, if there are more than two candidates on the ballot, uh, then our current voting system has some problems, and that gets back to the First Amendment. So our current plurality voting system fails to eliminate the spoiler effect, which I'll discuss in a minute, uh, and that uh, disincentivizes and discourages independents and third parties. Uh, our current voting system limits honest choices in the voting booth. Uh, our current voting system thwarts majority rule by helping divisive candidates to succeed in crowded fields. And our voting system distracts from healthy issue-based campaigns. And finally, our voting system chooses candidates in low participation primary elections. So we'll get into the, these things uh, throughout the, the, the presentation. And just to give you an overview, uh, we're gonna talk about our current voting system, some of the problems with our current voting system. Uh, we're gonna talk about some solutions. Uh, spoiler alert, our solution is ranked choice voting. Uh, we're going to talk about criticisms of ranked choice voting, and I'm going to divide those up into what I feel are illegitimate criticisms and legitimate criticisms. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss some of the opposition to ranked choice voting, and then we're going to have an opportunity, hopefully, to try, uh, you can try ranked choice voting out yourself. Uh, so as we move along, let's talk about the spoiler effect. So spoiler effect is a situation where it has a kind of a technical definition, but for the sake of our conversation, I'm just going to define it as a situation when there are more than two candidates in an election, where if you vote for the candidate that you love instead of the candidate that you like or can tolerate, you can paradoxically end up electing the candidate that you don't like. And the preeminent example of this was about 23 years ago in the state of Florida uh, with the presidential election. Uh, in 2000, and for those of you who don't remember, there was uh, George W. Bush. He was the Republican candidate. Al Gore was a Democratic candidate. And then Ralph Nader ran on the Green Party ticket. There were actually, I think, about eight other candidates, but they don't get, get mentioned. Um, and this was an incredibly tight election because of the Electoral College. It came down to Florida. And even in Florida, it was an incredibly tight election where the election was decided by 537 votes. Um, now, there were a whole lot of shenanigans with this election. We're not going to get into that. Uh, but just in terms of face value, this was an incredibly uh, tight election. And uh, there was some polling done after the election where they asked uh, Nader supporters uh, if he weren't in the in running for the uh, running in the election, uh, who would they have supported in as their second choice? And a majority said that they would have supported Al Gore. So Ralph Nader is then labeled a spoiler, having and been blamed for Al Gore losing the election and paradoxically electing George W. Bush. 
However, we get back to the First Amendment. Ralph Nader, as a citizen, has a First Amendment right to run for office. All of his supporters have a First Amendment right to vote for whomever rep represents them best. However, our current voting system is what's known as a zero-sum game, meaning in any kind of binary, dualistic, uh, right-left choice, the more candidates are on one side of the aisle, the more likely they are to split the vote, and paradoxically, that helps the other side of the, of the aisle. Um, and this creates uh, an incentive, or this creates a phenomenon for uh, people where they feel like they have to vote for the candidate that can win, not necessarily the candidate that represents them best. It's kind of known as having to vote for the lesser of two evils. It creates animosity amongst people that generally agree on issues. For example, you know, Al Gore supporters and Ralph Nader supporters generally agree on the issues, but there's animosity that you know, Ralph Nader siphoned or stole votes from Al Gore and cost Al Gore the election. So the structure of our, the way that we vote is already creating this tension in the electorate and in our country. Um, but the spoiler effect, this vote splitting uh, phenomenon is not partisan. It is a structural issue with the way that we vote. This is an example of where vote splitting and the spoiler effect went against Republicans in 1992. In case you weren't familiar, uh, George H.W. Bush was the incumbent president. He was the Republican. Bill Clinton was the Democrat. He was uh, challenging. And then Texas billionaire Ross Perot uh, ran as an independent, as a third party candidate, and he was extremely successful, even though he didn't win any electoral college votes. He got nearly 19% of the popular vote. And uh, it's, uh, it's generally perceived that if he weren't in the race, George H.W. Bush would have benefited and probably got the majority of those voters. Thus, uh, Ross Perot is labeled a spoiler. Um, and just some personal insights. Ralph Nader is my personal hero. He's the reason why I've kind of gotten involved in all of this. And uh, Ross Perot was one of my dad's personal heroes. He was never, I never saw him as excited uh, for a candidate as I did for Ross Perot. So I come by this naturally. Um, but you may be saying to yourself, well, John, you know, that Ralph Nader example was 23 years ago. Uh, this Ross Perot exam example is over 30, ago, 30 years ago. Uh, surely this is not a problem anymore. And um, I would say, please don't call me Shirley. Um, Shirley is my uh, name when I perform in drag for uh, drag, drag Queen Story Hour. I'm teasing. Um, but this is still an issue. So we're looking at 2024 for the Arizona Senate election. Now, Carrie Lake hasn't officially announced this is just a representation because there's going to be uh, a Republican candidate. Um, but this was polling done after Ruben Gallego announced that he was running for office. And there's there's a very good potential that there's going to be vote splitting uh, in this upcoming election that somebody may win without having necessarily a, an absolute majority, meaning more than 50 percent of the vote. And this doesn't even take into consideration that uh, the last two Senate elections, there's been a third party candidate that gets at least two has gotten at least two percent. So there's there will possibly even be more candidates that are going to be splitting the vote. And we, we may see a candidate win uh, a plurality of the vote, meaning they get the most votes, but they're not necessarily getting a majority of the vote. And are they truly representing uh, the electorate if they can't win with that, an absolute majority? So this is this is what we know is known as vote splitting or the spoiler effect. And this vote splitting and spoiler effect has a negative influence on whether candidates choose to run or not. This spoiler label is incredibly powerful and it disincentivizes candidates from running. It has a chilling effect on candidates. And we saw that in 2018. Uh, in this example, Kirsten Sinema was then a Democrat. Uh, um, Martha McSally was a Republican. And then there was a Green Party candidate, Angela Green. Um, she got a tremendous amount of pushback because it was a tight election and people thought she was going to split the vote and be a spoiler. Uh, she got death threats, she got constant harassment and things of that nature. And she decided to drop out after ballots had been printed, after votes had started being cast, but before election day. And then she endorsed Kirsten Cinema. Um, so, regardless of how you feel about uh, Angela Green, um, the question has to be asked how many candidates are not running and giving voters choices? because of the structure of our current voting system and this spoiler label. Uh, the exact same thing happened in 2022 for this time on the right side of the aisle, uh, the libertarian candidate Mark Victor 
pretty much did the same thing. Uh, he dropped out after ballots had been printed, after votes had been cast, but before the election and, Bla and endorsed Blake Masters because he didn't want to be labeled a spoiler. Uh, Bernie Sanders was asked why he chose to run as a Democrat instead of as a, an independent, and he told the uh, journalist Chris Hedges, I didn't want to be treated like Ralph Nader. Uh, Howard Schultz, uh, the CEO of Starbucks, considered making a run for president in 2020 as an independent, but he decided not to because he didn't want to be labeled a spoiler. Uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, wanted to possibly run as an independent for president in 2016. He chose not to because he didn't want to be labeled a spoiler. So this spoiler label that's a direct result of the structure of the way that we vote is a powerful disincentive from people running for office. And regardless of how you feel about these candidates, as we saw, Americans want choices, but the structure of the way that we vote disincentivizes, discourages, and in some cases punishes candidates for, for running and giving voters choices. So there's the spoiler effect, there's the spoiler label, but there are more issues concerning, uh, with the, concerning, the, uh, concerning the structure of the way that we vote. Uh, there's the issue of what are known as wasted votes. So we see this a lot in uh, presidential primaries where people vote early for candidates who later drop out before election day and voters don't have an ability to make a backup choice or to re-vote. And we saw this happen in 2020 in the Arizona Democratic presidential primary. 22% of voters voted for a candidate who eventually dropped out before uh, election day and didn't have an opportunity to cast a backup choice. But again, this is nonpartisan. Same thing happened in 2016 in the Republican presidential primary in Arizona, where 19% of Republican presidential primary voters voted for somebody who uh, eventually dropped out before election day. But this is not the only thing that's wrong with our current voting system. The vote splitting or spoiler effect uh, is used as a strategy by some unscrupulous candidates to recruit what are known as sham candidates. So candidates that really have no desire to actually compete and run for office, but they're running intentionally to split the vote uh, to try and benefit one candidate. And in 2011, I believe this was 2011, uh, Republican operatives recruited people, uh, some in some cases homeless people, uh, to run on the Green Party ticket to intentionally split the vote uh, to try and benefit uh, Republican candidates. And then also there was a... Uh, Republican state senator, his name is Russell Pierce. He was up for a recall election and he recruited a, a sham candidate to try and split the vote. And it wasn't successful, he was recalled. But this is a, a, a tactic that's facilitated by the structure of the way that we vote. And it's not illegal, it's unethical, um, and it's kind of seedy and a shenanigan as far as I'm concerned. But this is something that our, our current voting system incentivizes. But there are even more issues with our current voting system. There's a paradox where voters want more choices. However, with our current voting system, the more choices there are on the ballot, the more likely there it is that somebody's gonna win without a majority. There's gonna be a non-majority winner, meaning they get the plurality of the vote, they get the most votes, uh, but they don't win with an absolute majority or more than 50% of the vote. And we saw this happen in 2016 in the Arizona Republican Congressional Five uh, primary. Um, Andy Biggs completed, competed against three other candidates or four candidates in the race, and he won by the skin of his teeth. He only won by 16 votes, um, but he, didn't, he done, did not even get 30% of the vote, meaning over 70% of the Republican primary voters in that primary voted for somebody else, but because he got the most votes, uh, he won. Uh, and then because that's, that's a pretty solidly Republican district, he went on and won easily in, 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 the, uh, in the general election. So, um, we're going to talk about solutions. Again, spoiler alert, it's going to, our solution is ranked choice voting. You may disagree with this solution as after I talk about it, but I hope you realize that these are problems. And these are problems that are not being addressed by, by anyone. And when we start talking about some of the opposition to ranked choice voting, um, and if we get into a campaign and get on the ballot and we have, you know, debates and things like that, I just want you to recognize that our opponents will never talk about these problems. Um, they just completely ignore it. So whether you think they're as big a problems as we do, um, they do exist. So just keep that in mind. So uh, speaking of solutions, some people will say, well, what about runoff elections? And we don't have runoffs here in Tucson. This was kind of foreign to me uh, until I started kind of getting involved with this. But 
runoffs are essentially uh, an election where everybody competes. Um, and then if nobody gets more than 50% of the vote, then all the candidates except for the top two vote receivers are eliminated. And then there is a follow-up runoff election. And this has some benefits. Um, everybody gets to compete. And then you have a mano a mano uh, kind of election where somebody wins, somebody loses, somebody wins with 50% of the vote. Uh, there's no this kind of vote splitting. Um, however, there are some significant problems with runoff elections. So there is a decrease in turnoff in turnout for runoff elections. This particular uh, election, there was a decrease in turnout of almost 50%. Um, which calls into question uh, the validity or how representative uh, this election is if uh, less than 50% of the people who initially turned out are then choosing the winner. Um, they also tend to be needlessly expensive. This particular election cost the taxpayers of Phoenix uh, more than a million dollars. Sorry, I forgot to set this up. This is a mayor's election in uh, 2018. Uh, we, I think we can all generally agree that that money could probably be spent elsewhere and be spent better. Um, but even with like high profile uh, runoff elections, I'm sure we're all probably familiar with the Georgia runoff for the Senate in 2022. Um, there was a drop off of over 400,000 votes between the general election and uh, the runoff. And that election is reported to have cost the taxpayers of Georgia more than $50 million. So, uh, you know, runoffs are a solution, but we don't think they're a, a good solution. So that brings up the question, what is the good solution? Ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is a pro-voter, nonpartisan voting reform. It's a simple upgrade to the way that we vote. Instead of just picking one candidate, you rank candidates in your order of preference, first favorite, second favorite, third favorite, and so forth, um, to uh, ensure that you express your preferences. And then uh, it'll, if your candidate that you love can't win, then you have backup choices. So instead of just picking one candidate with ranked choice voting, lets you rank multiple candidates in the order of your preference. And there are two aspects to ranked choice voting. There's the voting and then the vote counting, and we'll go over both of those right now. So the voting is as easy as one, two, three. You get your ballot. This is a ballot that was used in uh, Maine's second congressional district. Maine has used ranked choice voting for state and federal elections since uh, 2018. Uh, you get your ballot. There are multiple choices. And then you just ask yourself some simple questions. Who's my first choice? Who's my first favorite candidate? You find your first favorite candidate and you fill in the bubble. And then you ask another question. Who's my second favorite candidate? You find your second favorite candidate and you fill in the bubble. And then you ask yourself, do I have a third favorite candidate? If yes, you fill in the bubble. And if you have a fourth favorite candidate, you fill in the bubble. Just rank your choices in your preferences, in your preference. You can vote for as many or as few candidates as you want. There is no compulsory ranking. Uh, if you just want to vote for one person, you can. If you want to rank the whole ballot, you can. If you want to do something in between, you're more than welcome to. It is completely your choice. How you engage with the, the ballot is totally up to you. Um, there, there are some rules in terms of this is not Little League. You can't make everybody your first choice. Not everybody gets a trophy. Um, uh, you know, it, it makes no, as we go over the vote counting, it makes no uh, sense for you to rank one person with all your choices, just one person per box for your, pre represent your preferences, as many or as few as you want. So easy as one, two, three. Now, in terms of the vote counting, ranked choice voting has two rules. First rule is you have to win with an absolute majority. You have to win with more than 50% of the vote. Second rule is only first place votes count except for in the case of what's called an instant runoff. And I'll explain that in just a second. So this just kind of goes, goes over that. To win ranked choice voting, a candidate must get a majority of the votes, more than 50%, either in the first round or in the instant runoff. So we're just going to do kind of a sample election. Uh, we've got four candidates here that's not political. They're just, we just chose some colors. Um, and I'll tell you who I would vote for in this election, and then we'll go through the process of counting the votes. So in this election, I'm gonna vote for, I get my ballot, I'm gonna vote for light orange, number one. They represent everything I represent, they champion my issues, I love them. So I vote for them, number one. Number two, I like them a little bit better, or not as good, but I like them well enough. I like uh, light purple, so I'm gonna rank them two. I like dark purple, third best, 
they're not my ideal candidate, but push comes to shove, I can accept them. I'm not going to vote for, for Dark Orange. I really don't care for Dark Orange. And with right choice voting, you don't have to vote for any candidates that you don't like. So I fill out my ballot, number one, uh, light orange, number two, light purple, number three, dark purple. So then I submit my ballot. Everybody else votes their preferences, and then they submit their ballot. So then we count the votes, and then we go back to our two rules. Does anybody have an absolute majority? Does anybody have more than 50% of the vote? No, they do not. So then the question becomes, how do we get to a majority? So instead of having a separate runoff election where, we have to, where there's more campaigning, more text messages, more phone calls, more emails, more knocks on the door, more signs that blight, blight our city streets, we have what's called an instant runoff. Because everybody has been able to rank their preferences in, in order, what we do is we eliminate the candidate with the fewest number of first place votes, the, the least viable candidate gets eliminated. But everybody who voted for that candidate still plays an important part in the election because their vote then transfers to their second choice and then they recount the votes. So in this case, I voted for light orange. I had my voice heard, but unfortunately my person doesn't get a, get, uh, get a majority so they get eliminated. So then my vote transfers to my second choice, which will be light purple. Uh, there are people who voted for light orange. Maybe they liked dark orange. Their vote then transfers to, to, to dark orange. The voter controls how their vote is transferred. It's not up to election officials or the deep state or anything like that. It is totally decided by the voter and how they, and how they vote on their, uh, their ballot. So my vote then transfers to light purple, and then we go and count the ballots again. And then we go back to our two rules. Does anybody have an absolute majority? Does anybody have more than 50% of the vote? They do not. So we eliminate the candidate with the fewest number of first place votes. And then everybody who voted for that candidate, their vote then transfers to their next ranked vote. In my case, it will be my third place vote. My vote will then go to dark purple. And then we recount the votes. We go back to our two rules. Does anybody have an absolute majority? And the, the closed caption is obscuring this, but dark purple has 55%. So thank you. So they're the winner. Conceptually, it's just a sequential runoff. Conceptually, it's almost the same as if we voted in this round, eliminated the candidate with the fewest number of first place votes, and then re-voted again, and th then eliminated the candidate with the first fewest number of first place votes, and then voted again. Conceptually, that's what we're doing, but we're speeding things up. We're expediting the process by just ranking our candidates in our order of preference. So what are the benefits of ranked choice voting? Um, I'm going to parse this when, when usually we do these presentations are like 15 minutes and I've got to kind of hurry through the, the, uh, through the presentation and I don't kind of get to express some of the nuance, uh, there are, in terms of benefits, I would say there are absolute benefits and then there are tendencies and incentives. So I'll kind of go over those in, in, in regards to these benefits, but essentially you can vote for whoever you want. You can vote for the candidate that you love and the candidate that you like or can tolerate in order to try and avoid electing the candidate that you don't like. There's no more of this lesser two evils. Uh, the candidate, is, the winning candidate is guaranteed to have majority of support. I'm gonna put a little asterisk by that because we're gonna, because that'll come up in some of the criticisms of ranked choice voting. Um, but in general, the candidate wins with an absolute majority more than 50% of the vote. Voters get more choices because we change the structure of the way that we vote. We eliminate, or we don't eliminate, but we uh, mitigate this uh, vote splitting uh, effect, this spoiler effect, gets rid of that spoiler label. Candidates can compete on a level playing ground, can make their case to the voters. Voters get more choices. And an interesting incentive is that campaigns tend to become more positive. Uh, again, this is an incentive structure where candidates have to appeal to not only their supporters, but to their opponent supporters as well to try and get second and third place votes. And because they have to appeal to their opponent's supporters, they're less likely to be scorched earth negative. Um, now, this is politics, this is an incentive, this is not a hard and fast rule. You know, if we pass ranked choice voting, we're not gonna wake up with rainbows and puppy dog kisses and things like that, but it does tend to tamp down the negativity in terms of, of, of our politics. Another tendency is that it, uh, can increase uh, voter turnout. Um, 
if I'm perfectly honest with you, this is probably the weakest benefit. Um, the the actual research on this is a little bit mixed, and depending on the person's perspective, they accentuate whether it increases turnout or it doesn't have an effect on turnout. But the general idea is that more candidates compete. They're putting more issues that excite people to get them excited to participate. They have campaigns that reach out to voters and uh, you know get out the vote. So in general, it tends to increase voter turnout, but it's not a hard and fast rule. And then uh, this isn't, in, isn't usually included in our presentation, but I like to highlight it. It tends to remove barriers for women and people of color. It doesn't bias towards them, uh, but the analogy I like, to, I like to make is that women candidates and candidates of color uh, run a marathon with ankle weights on. They're still able to compete, but there's some barriers that hold them back. And ranked choice voting tends to remove those barriers. There's a, a, a group called Represent Women uh, that advocates for women running for, for office. And what they found is that women choose not to run for office for a lot of reasons, like uh, being told to wait your turn and you know not wanting to split the vote with other women. But uh, the negativity that's with our politics is a really big disincentive for female candidates because uh, the toxicity, toxicity of our current uh, campaigns and election system tends to be sexualized and tends to be more violent. The rhetoric tends to be more violent towards female candidates. So female candidates choose to not run in our current voting system. And you have to wonder how many talented uh, public servants and leaders are we missing out on just because of the structure and the disincentives that are created by, by our current voting system. And with ranked choice voting, uh, they found that women and people of color tend to win more often in ranked choice voting elections, not because it biases towards them, but because it removes barriers. So you may be thinking to yourself, well, this is all great, John, uh, but is this something in reality? In reality, is this used in reality? Uh, or is this just like some idea cooked up by political scientists in some, some university poli-sci department? And the reality is it's been around for over 150 years. It was actually created here in the United States in Massachusetts. I forget the gentleman's name. Um, it's been used internationally for over 100 years. Australia and Ireland have used it for over 100 years. Other uh, countries, New Zealand, Malta, India, use ranked choice voting in, for different elections. Um, but then you may be saying to yourself, well, well, John, that's great, but this is America. Is, is, is ranked choice voting used in America? And yes, yes, it is. So this map is meant to represent the different ways that ranked choice voting is used in the United States. I'm going to highlight, I'm going to go over all these, but in particular, uh, I want to point out Maine and Alaska. They use, those are two states that use ranked choice voting for state and federal elections. Um, Nevada has passed ranked choice voting, has passed that final five version of ranked choice voting that I mentioned earlier, but Nevada is a little bit strange. They have to They've gone through a, an initiative, uh, constitutional initiative process, but they in order in Nevada you have to pass constitutional initiatives twice in in a different election cycle. So they passed it once, and they're going to have to pass it again. Um, so they're they're right on the verge. Um, these purple dots are cities in the United States that use ranked choice voting. Uh, these orange dots are cities that have passed ranked choice voting and are going to use it next election cycle. The current number is that there is over 60 cities in the United States that either currently use ranked choice voting or are about to start using ranked choice voting. Uh, these blue states uh, use ranked choice voting. Uh, blue states are Democratic are states where the Democratic Party either uses ranked choice voting for presidential primaries or for party elections. Um, Utah, the Utah's Democratic Party uses it as well. I'm not sure why that ain't colored in. These red states are where Republican parties use ranked choice voting for, or have used ranked choice voting for party elections. Also, uh, the Utah Republican Party has used ranked choice voting for their uh, party elections. And then interestingly, uh, these southern states use ranked choice voting uh, for overseas and military voters in the case of a runoff election. So, so in case, so that voters, mainly military voters, but citizens who live overseas, so they don't get disenfranchised by ballots being mailed back and forth. If there's a runoff, they get a ranked ballot that they can rank their choices in case uh, a, a, an election goes to uh, a runoff. This was, I, I believe, uh, Georgia used it for the first time for the, for the, uh, for the runoff election in Georgia. And it all just going to highlight that Arkansas uses it as well, because I'll get to that when I talk to opponents and opposition. 
Uh, Hawaii uses it for uh, open, uh, for filling open congressional vacancies because uh, those usually tend to have a lot of uh, a lot of interest and ranked choice voting helps uh, kind of sort out the list. But if you if you notice down in the uh, southwest corner here of the United States, there is a, a figurative and little literal RCV desert that of course is our sweet home Arizona, which begs the question: Do Arizonans even want ranked choice voting? And the answer is yes, yes they do. This is completely independent. Uh, polling data done by the Center for the Future of Arizona. They hired Gallup, and in 2020, uh, they did a comprehensive polling of Arizonans on various issues to basically put together this report about what Arizonans want from their leaders to kind of put forward to political leaders to say, you know, put the partisan stuff aside, focus on these things. These are the things that Arizonans want. And one of the questions that they asked was, do you favor moving to ranked choice voting in state elections where voters rank candidates in order of preference, regardless of party? And the bottom line is that 60% of Arizona said yes to that. The high number was 77% in uh, Flagstaff, the low was 55% in Prescott, but it was a majority regardless of the, 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 the part of the state. Now, obviously this is doesn't have an opposition campaign talking bad about ranked choice voting. Um, but the, the polling suggests that Arizonans are open to this. And then there's some national polling. Uh, the University of Maryland uh, did national polling and they asked uh, Americans whether they wanted to use ranked choice voting in federal elections. And 61% of Americans want to use ranked choice voting in federal elections. The breakdown was 73% of Democrats want to use ranked choice voting, 55% of independents want to use ranked choice voting, and 49% of Republicans want to use ranked choice voting. And this public polling uh, kind of in our, our own organization's internal polling uh, here in Arizona is very similar. But now, just to kind of point out, the converse of this is true. 39% don't like ranked choice voting. 27% of Democrats don't like ranked choice voting. 45% of independents don't like ranked choice voting. And 51% of uh, Republicans don't like ranked choice voting. So again, this is not a partisan issue. The support for ranked choice voting is, is nonpartisan. And the opposition to ranked choice voting is nonpartisan, but we'll get that in, into that in, in a little bit later. So, um, kind of take a mental picture of that uh, map that I had of the United States, um, and I want to just highlight uh, different ways that ranked choice voting can be implemented because that'll lead into a kind of a discussion of what we, Voter Choice Arizona, are going to try and do in 2024. Uh, those 23 cities in uh, Utah use a form of ranked choice voting that is kind of referred to as single round ranked choice voting. There's no primary, there's no runoff. All candidates compete in the general election. They use ranked choice voting to, to find the winner with an absolute majority. Um, and that has some benefits, particularly on the city level when there aren't as many candidates, you know, budgets are tight. It allows everybody to express their First Amendment rights to run for office for access to the ballot. Um, but it has some drawbacks, especially if there are huge fields of candidates um, it, it doesn't do, it can be cumbersome if there are a huge number of candidates. So, so there are the positives and negatives to uh, what I call the, the Utah model. This, these uh, terms, Utah model, Maine model, Alaska model, those are things I've just came, come up as I've kind of learned things. You're not going to see this discussed in political science or anything like that. Uh, basically, the differences between all of these different approaches is how the primary is handled. So with the Utah model, there's no primary. With the Maine model, with the main model there maintains partisan primaries. So there's a Republican primary, there's a Democratic primary, they use ranked choice voting in the primaries, and then the candidates advance to the general election. And if they're independents, then they use ranked choice voting in uh, the general election. And Maine has uh, easier ballot access requirements and they have a history of and a tradition tradition of independence running for, for elections. So, th so that model works well for Maine. Um, their primaries are closed. So if you're an independent and you want to weigh in on the Democrat or the Republican candidates, you're shut out. Um, so, that's, so that's kind of the, the good and bad of that model. Uh, the Alaska model, as I refer to it, is a hybrid. Uh, they have what's called an open primary or a nonpartisan primary. There's no Democratic primary. There's no Republican primary. All the candidates compete in the open primary. And then in Alaska, the top four vote receivers in the open primary then advance to the general election where they use ranked choice voting to determine the winner. 
and uh, we're gonna we're gonna pursue uh, a variation of of the Alaska model called Final Five voting. There's gonna be an open primary, nonpartisan primary, and then the top five vote vote getters advance to the general election. Uh, the the benefit of that is all candidates compete. All voters can can vote for whoever they want. Candidates have to have to make appeals to all the voters, um, and then we eliminate the contenders from the pretenders, and then we have a serious debate in the in the in general election, and we can use ranked choice voting to decide uh, who wins. So, as I said, um, we're going to pursue an initiative in 2024. Uh, our initiative is kind of an umbrella initiative in terms of election reform, and the three reforms we're going to pursue are this final five voting for state and federal elections. Uh, we're going to authorize a local options package for cities if they choose to, if they want to opt in to using ranked choice voting, using that kind of single round Utah model. They're more than welcome to. They don't have to. It's an opt in. And then we're going to equalize uh, ballot signature requirements for candidates because there are different uh, signature requirements and different access requirements to the ballot, depending on whether you're a Democrat, Republican, independent. Independents can be required to get up to six times as many uh, signatures to get on the ballot as Democrats and Republicans. Um, so we're trying to equalize things to make them fair. Um, what good is it to have ranked choice voting if you don't have choices and if the if you don't have access to the ballot as a, if there's an un, unfair burden to try and get on the ballot and give voters choices. So those are the three uh, reforms that we're proposing. Um, this is not perfect. We're not suggesting that things are perfect. Um, there's actually. Um, if you kind of get nerdy about this stuff, there are other voting reforms that I won't get into um, and there's all kinds of you know, bad blood and arguing amongst people who support different types of voting reforms. Uh, but there's basically a, like a theory that's called uh, arrows and possibility theorem. It basically says there's no perfect system. They're just trade-offs and you've got to weigh the trade-offs uh, to decide what you want. So we feel this is a, a balanced approach. It kind of does a good job uh, of kind of weighing the, the positives and the negatives, but there will be uh, there will be criticisms, which I'll get into in just a second. So speaking of criticisms, let's let's talk about the criticisms of ranked choice voting. Um, as we get started, I just want to highlight this quote that I kind of just alluded to. It's from a conservative uh, economist named Thomas Sowell from the Hoover Institute at Stanford. There are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. As you try to get the best trade-off you can get, that's all you can hope for. So we've tried to, to balance things in terms of what we're pursuing. Um, but you know, you're all free autonomous individuals and you see things uh, how you see them. Uh, one of the interesting things I've noticed in the three years I've been uh, part of the organization is that just how people just view the same thing completely differently. We can be looking at that map and, and you know, agree that there's America, but then we have different thoughts on what, what America is. So, you know, we're not preaching religion. Uh, we're trying to solve some problems. If you disagree, that's fine. So as we proceed and talk about uh, criticisms, I, like I mentioned at the beginning, I've kind of uh, broken them down to what I feel are illegitimate criticisms and le legitimate criticisms, and we'll get into that just a, a second. Um, I want to point out that most of the criticisms that are attributed to ranked choice voting also occur, occur with our current voting system, and that's because the bottom line is, for the most part, critics of ranked choice voting just simply don't like it. They prefer things the way they are. They like the system that we currently have. That's their right. That's fine. But we think that there are problems that need to be solved. And that's why we're pursuing ranked choice voting as a solution. So let's get into the criticism, the illegitimate criticism, criticisms of ranked choice voting. Uh, so some people say, oh, it's too complicated. It's confusing. Um, there's something called an exhausted or inactive ballot. And uh, opponents of ranked choice voting use this kind of like scary rhetoric, like, oh, your ballot gets thrown away. And I'll explain that in just a moment. I don't think that's the case. But you can decide for yourself. Opponents of ranked choice voting will say it's not constitutional. It, votes, it violates one person, one vote. Uh, that's not the case, but we'll get into that. They'll say it's not fair. Why should voters get more than get more more than one vote? They don't, but I'll explain that. They'll say that it delays results. Um, it doesn't, but again, I'll explain all these things. Oops. Uh, they'll say that it, oh, it's a plot by Democrats slash liberals slash socialists slash communists. Ranked choice voting is nonpartisan. We'll get into that. Uh, is this what they do in California? 
Um, uh, California is a nuanced example, and we'll we'll explain that. Uh, opponents will say because they think that it's uh, because they think it's confusing and things like that. They think that it disenfranchises voters. It doesn't. Um, and they another recent one that I've heard is that uh, it creates milk toast candidates, like it incentivizes candidates to to not take stands on issues and people get too too nice. I guess I don't know. We'll we'll discuss that. So, anyways, those are the main ones. I'm sure I do these presentations all the time. Somebody always throws something out of left field that I've never heard before. That'll probably happen again today. But those are the main ones that I've noticed in the last few years in doing this. So, criticism number one is too complicated, confusing. Uh, we don't think so. Ranking things is something that we do intuitively every, every day. Um, you know, there are listicles on the internet, you know, listing basically ranking things. Uh, and we evaluate them and we think, oh, no, I wouldn't pick this as number one. I'd pick this as number two. We we rank things intuitively every day, and ranked choice voting is just capitalizing on that for our, our, our politics and for voting. Um, again, <laughs> and then again, um, ranked choice voting is simply ranking your choices, and then there's an instant runoff, a sequential runoff done one at one time Using those two simple rules, you have to win with an absolute majority, and then only first place votes, in, except for uh, the instant run, runoff, to get to an absolute majority winner. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, people who use ranked choice voting um, here across and you know across the globe, they generally feel that it's easy. And this is just an uh, example of polling done after Alaska recently implemented ranked choice voting. They used it. Um, in 2022 uh, for state and federal elections. 59% of Alaskans felt it was very simple. 20% thought it was somewhat simple. So 79% of Alaskans felt it was simple. You know, obviously there are 20% that didn't think it was simple, but the vast majority of voters feel it's simple. And we feel it's simple because uh, essentially it's so easy that children can do it. So, uh, so usually when you vote, you pick your favorite choice, right? Mm -hmm. In this kind of voting called ranked choice voting, you put them in order from your most favorite to your least favorite. Yeah, like Which is your most? The brown yeah. is your most favorite? What's your next most favorite? Purple. Purple. What's your third most favorite? What's your fourth most favorite? And your fifth most favorite? You just ranked your vote. Congratulations. So uh, a week or two ago, I met up with Scott to kind of go through the presentation, work out the, the technical aspects. And uh, Scott thought that this was kind of fishy. But I'm cha. Dad jokes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I think Guy, Geico would uh, would sue us for that. Um, but anyways, in 40 seconds, a child learned how to do ranked choice voting. We think it's simple. Obviously, people disagree. Some people uh, find it do find it uh, confusing. Uh, but I think with a little bit of explanation, some education, people can figure it out. So this is uh, example number one and how uh, easy ranked choice voting is. It's so simple that a child can do it. And then it's so, child that, so easy that a child can do it that they actually talked about it in uh, Amelia Bedelia's uh, first vote is a children's book. Uh, they talked about the sequential, they didn't, they didn't talk about ranked choice voting, but they do, did talk about uh, uh, the sequential runoff. It says down here, everyone voted, then they counted, uh, they counted the votes, then Miss Edwards crossed out the idea they got the fewest votes. They voted and counted again, and again, Miss Edwards crossed out the idea with the smallest number of votes. They kept doing this until two ideas were left. So. So easy that uh, it can be explained in a children's book. So we think ranked choice voting, we think this uh, assertion that ranked choice voting is confusing. We disagree with that. We think it's easy. Now, in terms of uh, exhausted or inactive ballots, uh, basically an exhausted or an inactive ballot is something, is a ballot that doesn't contribute to the, the ultimate decisive election between the top two candidates. And, uh, Basically, all voting systems have exhausted ballots. This, this is not um, this is not um, 
particularly related just to ranked choice voting. Essentially, if you vote for a write-in candidate, oops, if you vote for a third party candidate, an independent, or if you leave a line on the ballot blank, you've exhausted your ballot. And uh, in Arizona, in uh, the presidential election in 2020, uh, 34,000, over 34,000 Arizonans left the presidential line blank because they didn't like their choices. Uh, another 50,000 voted for the libertarian candidate, Joe Jorgensen, and then another 3,000 voted for uh, official writing candidates. So 78,000 uh, Arizonans chose to exhaust their ballot and nobody complained about it. It was not a blip on the radar because it's up to the voter how they choose to interact with their ballot. And whether their ballot and if their ballot is exhausted, it's because they've chosen to do that. Um, in terms of runoff elections, it's essentially equivalent to somebody showing up and running and voting in the primary election, but not showing up and voting in the runoff election. Uh, so crit critics of ranked choice voting will kind of parse when we say that ranked choice voting produces a winner with an absolute majority. They'll point to the exhausted ballot and say, well, technically it's, it's a manufactured uh, majority, but we have to compare it, compare ranked choice voting to its alternatives. Um, and again, there are no perfect, perfect, perfect solutions. There are only trade-offs. Um, with our current voting system, the incentives are there to discourage choices. People want choices, and there are still ex exhausted ballots. With runoffs, um, there's a huge drop in turnoff. The drop-off tends to be around 35%. Um, and you know, people choose not to show up and vote, and that's essentially what an exhausted ballot is. With ranked choice voting, if you choose not to rank a candidate that ends up being in that final round of counting, then your ballot is exhausted. And that's up to the that's up to the voter to decide if they want to rank rank uh, rank candidates or not. And it creates essentially a circular argument, um, which you may come across when we uh, get on the ballot, where opponents will say, "Rank choice voting it throw they they throw your vote away because of these exhausted ballots." And then we say, "Well, no." It's up to the voter. If you want to avoid having your ballot exhausted, you just need to rank a candidate that's probably going to end up in the in the final. You know, rank one of the most popular candidates that's probably going to end up in the in the the top two, and then they say, "But ranked choice voting supporters say you have to vote for candidates that you don't like." And then we say, "No, you can vote for whoever you want. You can vote for as many as few candidates as you want." And then the circular argument continues, and that's just because they don't like it. There's really, I don't think there's a whole lot of intellect intellectual honesty with that argument, um, but they, they're they kind of nitpicking on things uh, that they want to try and make scare you and confuse you about. Um, but the fact of the matter is they like things the way they are and they don't want things to change. So uh, I wanted to point out uh, this uh, quote, basically whenever ranked choice voting is, in, is implemented, essentially after the first time it's implemented, the loser sues and they, they uh, list all these uh, claims in their lawsuits. And when it came to Maine, and when the Maine implemented ranked choice voting, uh, the, loser sued, the loser in that uh, second congressional district uh, sued, but he lost. And the judge basically, when it came to this argument about exhausted or inactive ballots, said this, choosing not to participate in the additional rounds of ranked choice voting is not the same thing as having your vote tossed out. Ranked choice voting is not unfair just because some people choose not to follow the process. And that was Judge Lance Walker. He's a U.S. federal district judge, and he was appointed by Donald Trump. Donald Trump. So this is not a partisan thing again. Um, so that's the issue of uh, exhausted ballots. In reality, in comparison to runoff elections, uh, the exhausted ballot count is actually better with ranked choice voting. That number of exhausted ballots actually decreases because people have more choices. They, they can interact with the ballot however they wish. And then people will say, oh, ranked choice voting is unconstitutional and violates one person, one vote. And uh, that's not true. Basically, it's been litigated for 80 years. Here's all the case law uh, where ranked choice voting has been challenged in the courts. It's never lost. It's always won because ranked choice voting is constitutional. And along those same lines, they say, it's not fair. Why should some voters get more, more than one vote? And the reality is uh, voters only get one vote, but it's transferable uh, in a sequential runoff to ensure that somebody wins with an absolute majority. In terms of uh, 
people saying that it delays results, that's not true. Uh, the actual running of ballots is essentially the same. Once ballots are in hand, it takes essentially the same amount of time to run it through voting equipment. Um, there are best practices. Basically, the hang up tends to be with people wanting to hear, hear results. Um, and there are best practices where basically if it is going to be an instant runoff, they can re release the first round results, which are essentially the same thing as our current voting system to give a people an idea of who's leading and where things are going. And the interesting thing is another criticism that I didn't include in the list just because the list got too long was they'll say, oh, ranked choice voting leads to marginal candidates getting elected. The reality is that over 90 percent of the time, the person who gets the first number of the most number of first place votes in the first round usually ends up winning. And for me, that begs the question, you know, why are we going through all this process? If over 90% of the people who get the first, the most number of first place votes wins, why do we go through this whole rigmarole? And that's because elections are about more than just the horse race. They're more than just about who wins. Obviously, you know, uh, elections have consequences, who wins matters. But they're also where we as citizens come together and we put issues on the table, we discuss solutions. Um, <laughs> then, uh, so, and then also I think it's a, just a very human need to want to feel heard. Uh, so people want to have choices, they want to be represented, they want to feel heard and ranked choice voting allows that and it allows us to kind of coalesce to give people choices and yet come to a winner that, that we can all agree upon. Uh, uh, Opponents of ranked choice voting will blame delays on ranked choice voting that are not related to ranked choice voting. So, um, and we currently have delays in the official uh, canvas of our own elections right now. And those are usually related to things that, that are not related to ranked choice voting. There are ballot errors, uh, and then voters are usually giving a certain amount of time to what is known as cure, cure their ballot. Uh, after every election, there are activists from both parties that run all over communities trying to get in contact with people to cure errors in the ballot. The ballot just because we want people's vote, voices to be heard, they want their ballot to be uh, to be counted, but that slows, uh, delays uh, the vote counting results, but that has nothing to do with ranked choice voting. As I mentioned before, um, there are overseas voters and uh, the Statute is called UOCAVA, the Uniformed Overseas Citizens Absentee Voter Act. Um, different states and localities have different rules about uh, when overseas ballots need to be in. Some people, some uh, require that it be in by election day. Some, you know, municipality, municipalities and states give uh, voters like a week. Like there's criticism of uh, the results be delayed in Alaska and in New York City for their primary. And that was, part of that was because they allowed for at least a week after the election for overseas ballots to come in. Had nothing to do with ranked choice voting. It was a it was like in statute that uh, that would have happened regardless of the voting system. There's also pr provisional ballots that need to be uh, checked that del delays vote results and city ver verification of mail-in ballots. So people want the freedom to vote by, by mail at home, but they leave it on their coffee table. They wait till the last minute and then they drive to a drop box or a polling site and drop off uh, their ballot. But a signature for that ballot needs to be verified before it can be counted to ensure that there isn't ballot stuffing and things like that. So uh, so that delays uh, vote results that has nothing to do with ranked choice voting. And then the uh, claim that it's a plot by Democrats, liberals, socialists, communists, um, Ranked choice voting is nonpartisan. Um, this uh, criticism tends to come from a certain faction of the Republican Party, but Republicans use ranked choice voting. Uh, this is an example of just recently the Utah Republican Party used ranked choice voting for their presidential straw poll. Um, they've used it for uh, party elections. Uh, the Indiana Republican Party in 2020 used ranked choice voting when they couldn't meet physically for their convention uh, because of COVID. The Virginia Republican Party has used ranked choice voting uh, to nominate candidates in their conventions. In the last uh, convention that they had, they nominated their governor candidate, their lieutenant governor candidate, and their attorney general candidate using ranked choice voting. And all three of those candidates went on to, to win their offices in, in Virginia. And then, interestingly, Donald Trump actually won a ranked choice voting election in 2020 in the state of Maine. Uh, as I referenced before, there's uh, 
Maine has two congressional districts. I kind of use that ballot for as an example of uh, how the ballot looks. In uh, Maine's second congressional district, they actually in Maine, they break up the electoral college votes in our, that are awarded by congressional district. And uh, Donald Trump won Maine's second congressional district with an absolute majority, even though there were multiple candidates. He won an absolute majority in the first round. There was no instant runoff. Um, but interestingly, um, actually a Democrat won the congressional race. So this leads to an interesting uh, in, uh, instance with ranked choice voting is that when voters are given choices, you can't put them in a box. They don't behave the way that you expect. Like in Alaska, we're, you know, there's a huge amount of criticism on the right because of what happened in Alaska. Uh, they're upset that Mary Poltella, the Democrat, won. And they're also upset that uh, Lisa Murkowski won, even though she's a Republican. Uh, but the bigger uh, picture of Alaska is that a very conservative Republican won for, for governor, a very conservative governor won, a uh, lieutenant governor won in Alaska, moderate Republican won for Senate, moderate Democrat won for uh, for the House, and then the Republicans won the State House and uh, and Senate. Uh, so it was a pretty impressive showing for the Republicans using ranked choice voting. But again, uh, there's criticism that is somehow some uh, bias towards towards Democrats. And like I said, with the uh, the national polling, you know, 73% of Democrats support ranked choice voting, but that's not 100%. The Support for ranked choice voting is nonpartisan, and the opposition to ranked choice voting is nonpartisan. And the main thing is that ranked choice voting simply reflects the majority of the electorate. That's all it does. It allows the major the electorate to come together and decide who's the best candidate uh, to represent them. This is a, a screenshot of some polling data from Utah's Republican Party for their uh, party convention in 2020. Uh, they asked the delegates from the Republican Party you know, in, can, in races of three or more candidates, we used ranked choice voting. Um, how'd you like it? 72.37% of Republican delegates. So these are hardcore Democrats, uh, excuse me, hardcore Republicans that are involved in party uh, politics. 72% of them liked ranked choice voting. There are no concerns about confusion. There is no concerns about exhausted ballots. There are no claims of vote rigging or anything like that. Ranked choice voting is nonpartisan. Is this what they do in California? So California is uh, uh, a unique example because there are cities in California that use ranked choice voting. If you kind of remember back to that picture uh, of the United States, there are little uh, purple and, and, and uh, orange dots. But overall for the entire state, uh, California uses what's known as a top two nonpartisan or open primary system. Again, all the candidates compete in the open primary, there's no Democratic prim primary, there's no Republican primary, and then the top two vote receivers advance to the general election. But there's no ranking because uh, there's no ranking in the primary and there's only two candidates in the uh, runoff, so there's no ranking. Um, some people like this. Uh, uh, there's a problem in terms of heavily uh, weighted districts that are either heavily Republican or heavily Democrat. You can get a general election where there's just two candidates from the same party and it becomes a race within the party and that's not representative of the community. So we don't like that. We're not doing that. Ranked choice. This is not ranked choice voting. Uh, the legislature in California passed ranked choice voting and uh, Governor Newsom uh, vetoed it. So ranked choice voting is not in California. So a different. So the claim that it disenfranchises voters, well, voters have complete control over how they engage with, with ranked choice voting. They can choose to rank as many candidates as, as they want or not. Um, ranked choice voting simply empowers voters rather than disenfranchise, disenfranchises them. And then the criticism that uh, it creates milquetoast candidates, i.e. no one will stand for anything. Uh, candidates are actually incentivized to bring different issues and solutions to the table to distinguish themselves, to set themselves apart. Uh, ranked choice voting uh, just incentivizes these candidates to make their case civilly and to make the case for candidates to vote for you instead of voting against uh, the opponent. So those are all the, what I we consider the illegitimate criticisms. Uh, the legitimate criticisms are because there are no perfect solutions. And again, there are trade-offs. There are issues with ballot design. If you include more choices, uh, 
the ballot is going to be bigger. There's going to be uh, some design issues. It's been used for over 150 years. Their best practices. So it is an issue, but it's something that can be mitigated. Uh, voter education, you know, people need to be educated on how this works. That's what we're doing here. Uh, that's what we would do if we had a camp, if we have a campaign to get on when we're on the ballot. And then after it gets implemented, then candidates and election officials will continue to do education. So it's an issue, but it's something that can be managed and mitigated. Uh, there may be a marginal increase in mailing costs if the ballots are bigger. You know, sometimes uh, a ballot may have to be on two pages or it may have to be, look like a CVS receipt or it's long. Um, you know, there may be some extra bulk that may increase the, the, uh, the mailing costs. For uh, state and federal elections or, or for statewide elections, it'll require some centralized counting. Uh, so in our proposal, we'll, we leave it up to the Secretary of State how, of how they want to handle it. In other uh, states and municipalities, they have uh, either transport ballots physically or they have what's called the cast vote record put on a secure zip drive and have it securely uh, couriered uh, to the, the vote center to be counted. So there are some costs involved with all these things. Um, there are other issues in, in the past. Uh, some election officials have made mistakes in terms of implementing ranked choice voting. Uh, it's not great but we all we we as an or as a, a movement that supports ranked choice voting we learn from all these things uh there have been cases where ranked choice voting has been repealed it was used in the like the 1930s in ohio and then uh women and people of color and organized labor started getting elected and then it got repealed so i'll let you look into the uh you know read into that as you will uh in ann arbor michigan the first black mayor got elected with ranked choice voting and then it mysteriously got repealed um and then there are there are sometimes there are issues where uh, somebody gets elected and they they become an unpopular uh, official and then they blame ranked choice voting and, and repeal ranked choice voting because they didn't like who they voted for. Um, that happened in Burlington, Vermont. They elected somebody they didn't like them. They blamed ranked choice voting. They repealed it, but then Burlington, Vermont just realized it wasn't it wasn't the voting system, it was the candidate. So they actually voted just to recently to re-implement ranked choice voting in Burlington. So, so ranked choice voting is not perfect, but in over it's been used for over 150 years. It's used internationally. Um, we think the trade-offs of giving voters more choices, increase, uh, changing the incentive structure and uh, ensuring the majority winner more than make, off, make up for these legitimate concerns. Um, just a couple a quick note about our uh, opposition. The Arizona Free Enterprise Club is a, a group of business people that are vehemently against ranked choice voting. This is a screenshot from a tweet where they are soliciting, uh, you know, funds and, and feedback from their supporters. And in the tweet, it says, select your top issue in our simple survey and then rank the five options in order of preference. And then if you clicked on this uh, link and went to their website, Right in this area here, it says rank your top priorities. Place the following issues in your order of preference. So again, our, our, our opponents, you know, there's no concern here about voter confusion. There's no concern here about exhausted ballots. There's no concern here about vote rigging. They just don't like it. They don't want to change. The other uh, big opponent of ranked choice voting here in the Arizona is a part of the of the Republican Party. Now, I want to be completely clear. Ranked choice voting is nonpartisan. We have Republicans in our organization. We have Republicans in our uh, advisory group. We have Republicans that are uh, donors and, and supporters and volunteers. But there is a, a group of Republicans, mainly elected leaders and party officials, that are vehemently against ranked choice voting. But in, recently, a state House representative, a Republican, was expelled from the House. Uh, won't get into the details of that, but they had to come up with uh, this was in a legislative district number number 13 uh, they had to come up with uh, three candidates to submit to the Maricopa Board of Supervisors to then appoint to replace this person and they essentially had a sequential runoff so this is the criteria and the announcement for the special meeting where they came up with the the candidates and if any round so basically they have multiple candidates It'll be a round by round a sequential runoff. If any round, there is no winner that receives more than 50% of the vote, 50 plus 1% of the vote. Uh, the nominee who placed in the bottom 20% will be dropped from the next round. So they have a progressive elimination. 
There is no, there was no ranking, but there was essentially a sequential runoff, and in our opinion, is essentially a slow motion ranked choice voting process done by the Republican Party that actively opposes ranked choice voting. So I've talked way too much. It, it's, I thought it was going to be an hour. I've talked an hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to, to do ranked choice voting. If you have the ability to use this QR code, um, you can go to a website where we're, we can do a little ranked choice voting poll on your favorite Arizona uh, tourist attraction, and then we can go through the results of that. Um, Otherwise, uh, I will and, open it up to Q and A. And so, for those of you who are online, we dropped that link in the chat for you, um, so you can use that and um, access this the uh, poll. So I apologize for rambling on. I wanted to make sure I left enough time for for Q and A. Um, but as people kind of fill out their their ranked choice voting poll, you know, just to tie things, put a bow on it. You know, why ranked choice voting? Uh, you get to vote for whoever represents you best. You can we can as a as a community calls less around consensus candidates, it, it changes perverse incentives that hopefully make our, our politics and our community better. Um, it's about you. It's about you, the voter, and being able to make the best choice of, uh, that represents you. And we simply feel it's a better way to vote. These are some uh, little uh, catchphrases that we've kind of come up with in the last two years. Are you tired of voting for candidates you don't like and being divided by politics? Do you want more voice and more choice? Uh, it's simply a better way to vote and bad systems beat good people. So those are some of the creative things that our uh, volunteers have come up with. And with all that said, thank you very much for your time and attention. Our voter, our website is Voter Choice Arizona. We love to give these types of presentations. It would never be this long. <laughs> this is a special circumstance for the for Osher since you have the time and it's a, a class type format. But if you want to request a presentation for your group, just go to Voter Choice Arizona, go to the contact button and then request a presentation and then there's my email in case you have want to email me any questions so i can share the um the poll so we can do it live here in the classroom and online i'm i'm going to vote on my computer so um basically uh, on the screen is our yeah. is our poll so uh, i'll just uh, so, scott go ahead and share I'll go ahead and participate okay. and um, just random. And then I'm going to hit vote, I guess. Yes. And on the screen, then we can see. So this just jumps to the, the winner. And then there's a little drag bar here where you can see the round by round. So is it only one round because okay. we got a... So this just populated off of your vote. Ah. So there's a separate link that has everybody's uh, everybody's um, results. Gotcha. So we'll give people a little bit of time to, to fill that out. We'll, we'll go and open it up to uh, questions, and then we'll try and put a bow on it and go through the round-by-round round voting. So we... We actually had about uh, 100 at one point. There's about 88 on there right now. So, so uh, if anybody has questions in the room, Ashley's willing to help. And then we will uh, alternate questions between online and... So on the Alaska model... Yes. It seems like um, everyone in the general election could end up being of the same party. Is that correct? Theoretically, yes, but practically no. Okay. I mean, unless it's. But in theory, they it, could all be the same party. In theory, they could. I mean, it probably wouldn't happen, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. That has happened. So, no. Doug Syme, if you want to unmute yourself online and ask well, your question. For the. To my knowledge, that that didn't happen in the governor's race. So th this Alaska model is kind of a new innovation. So Alaska was the first one to use it. Um, I can't speak for the you know House and Senate elections within Alaska, but for the major elections, the governor, lieutenant governor, U.S. Senate, and the House, there was um, Republicans, Democrats, and some of the some of the elections there was a Libertarian, Independents, things like that. So, Doug Syme, you had your hand up there. Uh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. 
Um, the first thing I was going to say is that I come from a country that has multiple seat ranked choice voting. So in each constituency, there is actually more than one candidate. So I do agree that that's probably too complicated for Americans. <laughs> Rank cho ranked choice voting is, to my mind, a very good compromise. And I will actually say that I have grown up with the idea that one does exhaust one's vote at the end of one's preferences to make sure that the candidate you don't want to gain a vote doesn't gain a vote. So even if it was the eighth choice or the whatever, you do not want that that last choice to be the one that puts your uh, other party over the over the limit. So I, I actually favor exhausting your ballot at the end of the ones that you like. Um, but my question was in regarding in regards to the initiative that was passed in 2022 that limits uh, citizens initiatives to one single subject. How are you going to combine ranked choice voting and um, open primaries in a single initiative? Sure. So uh, I, that's, that's a very good question. Um, um, we've gotten, uh, I mean, legal opinions that if we run it as like an umbrella initiative with the issue being uh, voting reform, then you can have a couple of sub issues underneath that umbrella reform. That's what happened in Alaska. Alaska has a single subject rule for their uh, their referendums, um, and they ran as a voting reform, and they had ranked choice voting, open primaries, and then uh, dark money as their voting reforms. So there's precedent for for this approach. Obviously, if we get the signatures we get on the ballot, we're going to get sued, and it's going to get challenged in the court. We'll have to we'll have to litigate that. Um, but we have taken that into consideration, and we do feel that there's precedent that we can do this. So I think uh, Mallory, you have the mic. Yeah, I, I um, now I could be wrong, but it seemed like in the Alaska race, it seemed like there were two Republicans, including Palin and uh, Mary. Pitola, yeah. So there were three of them, and it seemed like the Republicans split their votes. Yeah. And so, uh, so Mary won, thankfully. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> That's all right. Sorry. It's your, it's your anyway. <laughs> so I guess it can have some impact if there's a negative, I mean, ne negative, an odd number of candidates allowed. That right? was that was an odd situation because there was actually an independent that qualified to run in, in the top four. But then he dropped out before uh, the general election, and I'm not an expert on on that. You know, there was I'm not sure why they didn't just promote the fifth place finisher to then compete in the, in the general election. But they said no, this guy dropped out; it's too late. It was it was a special election because the previous uh, congressman died and it accelerated their timeline in terms of trying to implement this. So they really had to scramble. So I don't think they, in terms of these little nitty gritty, uh, you know, variations and things that pop up, I don't think they had planned that out. So when it came down to whether to promote the fifth place finisher or just go with three for that special election, they went with three. And then in like three months later, they had the actual uh, election and there were four candidates. And I believe, I want to say it was, it was uh, Begich, who was a Republican, Sarah Palin, a Republican, Peltola, and I want to say there was a Libertarian. Um, and she still won again. So, yeah. So again, like like I said, when when voters are given choices, they don't always behave how you expect them to. Very conservative governor, moderate Republican senator, mo moderate Democrat congressperson. It's Alaska. You know, we're, we're gonna... the thing, the thing about Alaska is that more than fifty five percent of their registered voters are non party designated. So even though they tend to be right of center, there's still a fairly in, very independent uh, minded kind of people. So we're, we're going to switch to an online question. Sure. Uh, Rod Norish, go ahead. You're, I think you're unmuted. Um, yes, the, the question being, um, is the party affiliation uh, publicized or is it part of, uh, of the ballot uh, where each candidate has their party affiliation uh, written on the ballot? I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna handle it, but it can. You, you can 
have candidates that still run as whatever party they are. The the parties just don't have that gatekeeping uh, ability to just choose one candidate. So candidates of all parties or independents or whatever, whatever persuasion can compete in the open primary. And then you've got to demonstrate your viability. You got to make the cut, make, be one of the top five, and then you can advance to the general election. And the parties can still, uh, they can still endorse candidates. So they still have, is, there's sometimes people that are very uh, attached to the parties feel like this would this would do away with parties. That's not going to be the case. They still have a, a tremendous advantage. Uh, they still have resources that independents and small parties don't have, uh, but it just allows for everybody to compete. We've got a question in the back corner here. Yes, I on the slide that you had with all the court cases. Yes. I wasn't quite quick enough to read were any of those cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't believe so. So there's some potential there that if a state adopted, such as Arizona, adopted ranked choice voting, it could be months before we had a final decision as to that election if it wound up before the Supreme Court. I think that's possible, but there's so much precedent at the district level that you know, they would have right. to come up with a very novel argument to overcome all 80 years of of case law and precedent. There's a lot of that around. Uh, well, that's true. There's nothing impossible. This is Arizona, you know, so who knows? And our next question, uh, Sherry, if you want to unmute yourself. Sure. I just want to say I have, uh, I thought the example of the child doing the fish and the voting was very interesting, but I, I still know people whose mathematical computation ability gets very confused when they start hearing uh, moving the vote from one person to another, et cetera. Their level of understanding mathematics and tolerance for it does not understand this. And I'm concerned that, that there is a lot of not understanding of ranked choice voting because of the um, just, how do I get to vote for somebody else? This doesn't make sense. Sure. Kind of thing. So I, um, we're not gonna actually ask voters to count their own votes. You know, that gets done by professional election officials and with, uh, you know, vote counting machines and things like that. All you have to do is be able to rank your candidates and then it's a sequential runoff. Um, and, you know, we've got at least a year before November 2024. So there's lots of opportunities to uh, to explain this. Um, you know, we can promote, we can have these little uh, tools where people can can practice it and, and use it themselves. So there's plenty of lead time to, to do the education. And hopefully I was able to explain it clearly for all of you. And you just need to be able to take some time and just walk through each, each uh, step in the process. And I think people are able, able to get it. Can I say something in response to Sherry? Uh, I agree totally that, you know, after I've done my ranked choice voting, I have no idea what happens, but it doesn't matter. I've done my ranked cho choice voting and the rest is up to the computers to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. You know, so we don't really need to understand what happens in that. I mean, exactly. you need to understand in concept, just yeah, so the that there's concept. no shenanigans, but yes. Right. You'll need a microphone. And while we're waiting for that, Doug Syme, if you want to ask your question. <laughs> well, I was going to make another comment. If the nation, which is not necessarily given a whole lot of credit for its intelligence, is able to understand and vote in multi-seat multi ranked choice constituencies. I really do think, I, I was perhaps a bit flippant at the outset, I really do think Americans could take on this concept. And I'll also say that in those multi-seat uh, constituencies, we don't need in Ireland to have primaries. We have maybe 15 people on a ballot, but we can rank, rank all 15 and or not rank the few at the end to exhaust the ballot when you've had enough. So I really do think that this is a much more equitable means of choosing candidates. And furthermore, I believe it could be eventually brought to the point of saving money on primaries and ultimately uh, providing the ability 
to have a much more representative Congress in terms of representing the opinions of different parts of the country. So I am totally in favor of ranked choice voting and I would be perfectly happy to see uh, primaries being eliminated. I wouldn't be at all opposed to the concept of longer periods between the house being elected, but that's a whole different subject, <laughs> uh, an argument for a different day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So we have Laura Couchman. Just one thing, if if we agree with Doug and, and you, and we think this is a good idea, is there a petition or something? Or what, what could we do? Those of us in the room who have been persuaded by your talk to sure. help uh, move the peanut for, go, forward. Go to Voters First Arizona, uh, our website. Um, just sign up as a supporter so we can communicate with you. Um, you know, every weekend I'm out at Barrio Bread and farmers markets talking to people and getting names and emails of supporters. And then probably in July or August, we're actually going to go to petition to get on the ballot. So sign up as a, as a supporter, give us your name and email so we can communicate with you so that once uh, once we do start to petition, we can be like, meet us here, sign the petition. Um, we need a microphone. You need a microphone. Isn't Voter Choice Arizona a 501c3, which means that donations could be made that are tax deductible yes. to support the efforts of this movement? Yes. Ju okay. Ju Julie is a part of, Rank Choice, of Voter Choice Arizona, and unsurprisingly, she's a, a part of our fundraising team. Um, so I, I didn't want to give the hard sell um, in terms of fundraising pitch, uh, it, but if you are so inclined to, to make a donation, you can go to voterchoicearizona.org and make a donation. It is tax deductible since we are a 501c3. Uh, and and ballot initiatives aren't cheap, so we need to raise as much money as we can. And I just want to point out for everybody online too, we do have the capacity to keep this going a little longer than normal. So if there, if there are questions and we want to keep going, it's, it's okay. Um, Maureen Metcalf, if you'd like to unmute yourself and I guess you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, uh, the more I listen to this, the more I think of small town America back in the old 1800s where you lined up jars with the name of the person that you were voting for and you drop your bean or your nickel or whatever. And then they counted all beans. And whoever got the most beans won. You know, it's basically, it sounds like it's as simple as that. You know, unless the person got less than 50% of the beans by population. I'm glad they didn't use marbles or you'd, everybody <laughs> would lose them. So. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> so even with a, a stone or a bean, you got to make sure they didn't bring a pocket full from home. I think we've got a question in the room. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what was Newsom's rationale for vetoing the initiative? Uh, he said it was too confusing for voters. So again, the the support for ranked choice voting is bipartisan. The opposition is, is it's bipartisan. Guy Brunt, if you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I've been uh, interested in ranked choice voting uh, as it provides greater opportunity uh, for more people to participate, but. Without campaign finance reform, don't we still have the issue of the money being spent and those further down the line not having their voice heard before the uh, the election takes place? Um, so the, there, there are there is there are other groups, uh, a group against dark money, uh, headed by Terry Goddard, former governor, governor. I don't remember before my time. Um, that are, are championing that they've always had success um, in terms of getting things passed, but then it always gets challenged in the courts. Um, so I I personally agree with you. That's not within the the scope of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but people are working on that here in the state, and that's currently being litigated. I I can't remember my brain, brain's a little bit mush, but I think that was on the ballot last election wasn't it yeah and it passed it did pass i mean it's it's extremely popular it's popular regardless of uh, across the, the partisan divide but certain segments who have money and want to influence things they then go to the courts and try and challenge and gum it up so so there so people are working on it but that's not what we're trying to accomplish david healy if you want to go ahead 
couple of uh, well, questions or comments. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, quite interesting and uh, educational. Uh, but in the question of, say, open primaries, do you think that's going to lead to one party states? And uh, basically, California is a good example of that. Um, I think the way California has done it has led to that. That's why we're expanding the number of candidates that have been advanced to the general election um, so that people have choices. And the registration in Arizona is, is fairly evenly split. It's, it's almost a third, a third, a third. Um, and then the, the thing to consider is the biggest chunk of voters in any any election are those who don't show up and vote. So mm -hmm. we hope that this is an opportunity to bring more people into the process. Um, and then we all get to vote and express our preferences and decide who the majority of us can coalesce around. Um, but I don't think I don't think we're going to see one party rule in in Arizona at any time. I think we're too evenly balanced. The other question is. Uh... Uh, could we include none of the above on the rank choice? Uh, we are As not a, going to include none of the above because we don't want to have the the, uh, the implications of what happens if none of the above gets the gets the majority. <laughs> well, I, I'd rather they go back to the drawing board in many cases, but I know that's not going to happen. Sure. Okay. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Uh, is there one in the room? Sorry. So, uh, Hugh, go ahead online, and then we'll take one more in the room. Okay. You know, I always felt the uh, uh, third party candidate, was a spoiler candidate, and all I can say this time is thank God for Liz Cheney as a spoiler candidate. You broke up a little bit. I didn't hear all of that. I I I said thank God for Liz Cheney as the spoiler mm -hmm. candidate. I I don't understand the context. Liz Cheney is a spoiler candidate for Trump. Oh, has she officially announced? No, nope. she... not yet. Oh, okay. We'll see. I mean, we'll see what happens. There, there's already already half a dozen people in the Republican primary already. There will probably be a bunch more. And actually, there are people in the Republican Party that are advocating to use ranked choice voting in the partisan, in the primary to avoid uh, this kind of vote splitting amongst the, the the party for president, for presidential candidates. Yes, I'm sorry. We'll take I, one last question. Yeah, Bridget. I just want to make sure I understood exactly what you said in response to someone else who sure. asked the question, will the ballot list the candidate's party? And I thought I heard you say we haven't decided yet. I, so, Emmy, you guys are a little bit more involved in leadership. Um, okay. So I, I spoke incorrectly. I wasn't sure. So it will list the candidates' okay. party identification. Thank you. As long as I have the mic, I'm going to ask a second question. Sure. I, I also, uh, at the beginning, uh, well, I understand why there are barriers to women and people of color running for office. I understand all that. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please explain again why ranked choice voting will be beneficial to women and people of color? It's just so the, when I had the original slide with all the organizations, Fair Vote is one of those organizations, and they've done research They with comparing uh, traditional elections versus ranked choice voting elections. And that that other group, Represent Women, has also dug into the date and they've just found that, okay. that women and people of color do tend to do better in ranked rank choice voting elections. And that's for various reasons that I, that I talked Thank about. You. So uh, John, there'd been a few comments in the chat. I, are we gonna be able to share your PowerPoint out with people? Is that shareable? Uh, no, the Voter Choice Arizona doesn't like sharing the PowerPoint. Sorry okay. about that. So we won't, but we will have a recording of yes. this presentation that we can share and we'll be able to email everybody who registered for that. And again, I want to thank John and Ron Cohen too for helping put this together and uh, thank everybody for joining us online today. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.